Okay, welcome to another video. Today it's about planning and decision making and coordination and uh, communist society. In this video, we'll talk about how signals such as work time and emissions can help anti-authoritarian planning, how scores products can be distributed, about the dangers of counts to communism and anarchist federation, and about how about police central network can combine these two systems, this central and decentral planning into another form of anti-authoritarian planning, how dependency suggests inclusion, and how conflicts and associations without hierarchy could be created. And I want to start with a quote by Avery Gordon, and it says, we need to know where we live in, in order to imagine living elsewhere. We need to imagine living elsewhere before we can live there. And that's kind of what we try with, like thinking about alternatives and utopia to really think about how could we organize it differently on a concrete level. Some of the things may be too concrete and it's like, ah, should we really do it like this or can we do it a little bit differently? But it's just, we make a model and we like, it's just a model and I, I'm sure some of the things are still not really like perfect or whatever, but as utopian, especially a um, domination for utopia is kind of a process that we go in together and we different, need different perspectives, like from the global north, global south, from workers, from academics, from whatever, and like a lot of different, um, perspective and privileges that have to come together um, so to order to make create this domination free society and utopia and ours is just like I, I, until now it helped a lot of people to think about it in a more concrete sense and to give them like kind of an idea where it can go to okay so i'll start with society and signals Societal coordination. Um, humans produce their living conditions, such so as market and patriarchy, on like the social level, but also like houses and language and everything. It's like human made. And but these living conditions can also be altered by humans. Like we can organize it in a different way. But society is independent from us, like the societal organization is, and when we live in a society, firstly, independent from us. But in, and it suggests a certain action, like that we should earn uh, money, that we need money to have life, that we um, <coughs> should define ourselves as male or female, and all these um, privileges and positions that come together with a global north, global south, all these things, it su suggests certain actions. Um, and in capitalism, and it's like the model we think of as society, because we, most of us at least grew up in capitalism, we see an independent self-replication. That's like what um, Adam Smith called the invisible hand. That's like not really us taking the decision, but there's this invisible hand, this market that is coordinating us and not we are coordinating each other, but we are coordinated basically, and we just mm, try to achieve our goals within these set mechanisms of social goals. Um, and in communism, there is also an independent frame of inclusion, we would call it, um, that demands our self organization. So we have to agree on the goals of the society, what we want to produce, um, how we want to care for each other, and all this kind of stuff. So coordination by signals in groups, and humans lived for some time only in groups, there was this possibility to directly interpersonal communication with each other, but in a society there's indirect transpersonal communication by signals. And these signals can be whatever, they can be letters, or they can be prices, or they can be laws, or whatever. And these signals, they allow local and coherent acts. So, for example, in a centralized command economy, the centralized prices and plan signals tells the companies what they have to produce so that at the end we will have enough bread and enough housing or whatever. And in the decentral market, the prices are allowed allow the capitalist rationality. And what you see on the right side is in, like termites. And these termites, they build like amazing structures and they do it very similar <laughs> to humans in a way that they communicate via signals between each other, like where, why like these um, pheromones um, that they can smell and then they know, oh, we have to build here. And this kind of signal communication, the humans use on a much 
com um, more complex um, manner. And the termites also have this decentralized. There's like no, no central termite that tells, the, tells all the other what to do. And markets and also communism work in, it, in a similar way. The communist stigma gay. Stigma gay means like a, a communication via stigma, via signals. And it's basically an ex ante coordination via signs. That means that all these companies and we as consumers, um, we produce signals that allow others to plan their production and reproduction. So they, these signals are um, can be like taken together and then they suggest what to do. They demand for energy or for childcare, the innovation of sulfur extraction, which is necessary because we don't find people for the sulfur extraction because it's so harmful and all that kind of stuff, or the available copper, that, copper that's in the system. And all of these kind of stuff, that are signals that can be used within this society. Furthermore, you have kind of signals that are on a more abstract level, like work time or emissions or energy use. And this becomes important because these signals are used to, if the society on a whole wants to agree in general goals that we want to um, lower our emissions or that we want to at least quantify the work time, even if it's not it exactly tells us what to do, but at least we want to know, we want to be able to compare how much time does this commons need to produce a table and how much time does this commons want to use. And so they want to put it into the protocols, into the interaction between the commons. And this allows the commons to compare um, between different partners and optimize the production chain. So it's very important for optimization quantification. You also can think about it on the consumption side. So if you go into a communist supermarket, the products may have like signals with not just the price, it tells you like three years, 50 or whatever, but it will tell you like the work time that's inside this computer or inside this mango or whatever, um, the job satisfaction or the ecological impact, the scarcity of the product. So it can tell you a lot about other things and not only on the consumption side, like for the, cons for the consumer itself, but also the um, consumer enterprise. So if we produce bread or something, then the wheat will have the one pound of wheat will have like a work time that goes into the, the ecological impact and all this time. So we can kind of calculate it all together. We can compare different products to each other and decide which are better for our companies, which makes sense to our consumption or whatever. <clears throat> and to go on a more concrete level, these, if we think about distribution in a communist society, then there is a, probably a free withdrawal for a lot of products, but it, may, it has to be restricted for scarce products. And there are different kinds how to restrict it, but if it's not like um, based on equality and need and not on performance and money or power. So it can be a lottery, it can be some sort of rationing. It's also like equalizing people. Um, there may be some things like some people like, like commonest credits, like you get a certain amount of credits each month that is like, um, independent of the work you've done, the performance you've made. Um, and with this, you can go shopping kind of. So it's, it's still closer to the capitalist or the real socialist idea. Um, you also can have conflict processes about it. And there are different techniques. So there, there's also in different communes, different supermarkets might have like different um, systems they use for rationing. Um, and these scarce products and they will communicate with each other and find out which are the best or which have the best results. So now up to the coordination level. If we think about coordination, we have like a centralized and a decentralized um, idea or concept that's important. And to sum it up, different mode of coordination. How do would we decide, shall we build a, this wind park or not? In a central park, it would be, in a central coordination, it would be pretty easy. There's just like the council institution decides um, what to do, if we should do it or not. In the decentral coordination type, there would be the communes that reach in accordance with each other that they will build this wind park. And in a polycentral coordination, which um, is attributed to communism, the project receives support from meter commons, from communes and reproductive commons and various levels. We'll come to this closer. So now we start with a central coordination. 
Um, there's like the central institution that tells reproductive commons and infrastructure commons what to do, what makes sense, what is needed so that we produce enough houses and buses and bicycles and all the things we need. <clears throat> and this idea is very much linked to Marxism um, and, and for Marxism always this centralization was very important kind of. And if we think of state critical parts of that or hierarchy critical um, people within Marxism, we would found the council communists. Um, and these say the councils are not a government for they have no organ to impose their will on the masses. They possess no means of violence. That's like the huge difference between a council structure and a state structure for some of the council um, communists. Others have no problem, <laughs> problem with means of violence. What then is the question if there are no means to force the people to do what the council wants them to do, how, why do they do it? And here Panikok, a council communist from the Netherlands wrote, what here secures the execution of the decision taken by the councils is their moral authority. But in such a society, moral authority has a more compelling force than any coercive power emanating from a government could have. And that's kind of, yeah, okay, it's kind of idealistic that I, it's just like moral authority, it's also very moral in a way, not that much of, you could also ask, argue with material organization, organization is so great, and this is kind of the argument that stands behind it. The Council Communists have really this dream of a perfect democracy, an institution that's so democratic that its decision convince rather than and doesn't need to enforce it. They are so good that the people just follow them. There are some dangers that are associated with council and with such a centralized structure we think. On the one hand this council institution may accumulate a lot, is accumulating a lot of power um, over um, the enterprises, over communes or whatever. There's a lot of power accumulated in this institution. Um, and this institution may use this power, they don't have to, but they could use it to make their decisions seem very good and better than other proposals or whatever. So they can use it as a mean to create hierarchy. There's also this mono-institutionalization. So there's often this idea how to think of socialization and a lot of times there's like if we think about society, how, how society acts, then it needs like one institution that kind of represents the whole society. And we think that kind of doesn't work, that there's like one institution that represents the whole society. And there's an implicit state logic behind it. There's like this one structure that tells people what to do. Or not tells them, but like convinces them what to do. The councils may become socially a government people that are in these council structures, they need a lot of time and a lot of experience in there, so they interact with other councils all the time, and this may, will probably create a group culture and a kind, maybe a managerial class, where they say, that's important, and we are all agreed in our culture, and the other people in the society are like, what happened there? Why are these councils so convinced that we need whatever? great houses or swimming pool or should do this project, we would rather think that um, ecological reforestation is very important or whatever, different kinds of stuff. The council may also become politically a government if they then use this power to really enforce their decisions or um, at least present it as the only possible way. They even may become a real state when they start really enforcing their decision. It may be easy for such a structure to rebuild um, a state structure with the means of violence to enforce the decisions. <clears throat> but this is all based on a society without a compulsion to work. So they, they still can't compel people to work, but this is very linked to, state, to the state logic. When you want to enforce a decision, the best way to do it is just people to pay them and not like to frighten them all the time with prison or with any, some penalties. But with money, it's a very easy way to get people to do stuff. So this compulsion to work, money, um, is very linked to state structure in a way or at least as the state is organized usually, or considered of usually. Some council communists then argue for uh, power to deselect um, the councils if they, don't, if they don't seem all right or the imperative mandate. But there's also the problem 
that the lower stages of these constant structures, it's very difficult for them to analyze if the decisions made by the higher structures make really sense because there's so much information asymmetry, like hierarchy, what these people know and they discuss this all the time and they have a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge. So it's kind of difficult to decide if they, if they act really rational or according to the interest of the lower levels or not. Within communism, therefore, we ask for flexible aggregation um, without central planning. Like there shouldn't be a central planning, but there may be aggregation at different levels that make sense. So the decentral coordination, um, there you have various communes that usually are thought of, it's like what the anarchist tradition and they're usually thought of um, being more or less autonomous, they have to, they're producing a lot of things they need for themselves and all this kind of stuff, and sometimes they will interact to for energy infrastructure or transportation infrastructure or complicated production for um, computers or whatever, where it's needed and they can build it on their communal level. So the decent coordination is a lot of time thought of like, like a federation of autonomous communes. And there are also some problems that come together with this. There's a lack of decision and reflection processes. Um, if they like for the interaction part of the communes. There's also a lack of planning, e.g. For, um, for highly dependent production. There, it's like very important to plan together and to come together and these communes may be tending to a more kind of loose network that don't really cooperate with each other, but everybody does whatever he or she wants to do in each common commune for itself. Um, and there might be the problem of disintegration, finally. So as the council common lands may lead to the state side, um, and therefore the compulsion to work may come again, um, this um, decentral coordination may lead to the market side, where these communes start to exchange again, and then the competition arises, oh, we can also compete like co cooperate with these communes because they give us the wheat cheaper or something and then the whole market structure arises again on a commune level, not on a directly enterprise level. Um, therefore, we argue for highly dependent decentrality with not these um, self-provisioning commune system. We call it polycentral coordination, which means that you have different actors at different levels um, making decisions depending on each other. Do you have the reproduction commons producing wheat or childcare or whatever? Um, and the social media commons that help with planning, they help with conflicts or different kind of. And the material media commons that provide kind of the infrastructure with water and energy and transportation. In this power center network, many actors on multi-level decide independency. So on the one hand, from a decentral perspective, you take um, the <coughs> focus of voluntariness and into independency. From the central part, you take um, the idea of dependency, the need for planning and for aggregation. So it's kind of a mixture between two models between the two models and not like something completely different or something. It's just, we still think of how can we combine these in the end, three different models in a way that it really works. Yeah, and ours is just this polycentral and we just bring it forward for like good discussion. Mm. And here it also becomes important that we have kind of general goals that um, build a connection between these polycentral or decentral actors. Um, and these general goals can be implemented by a protocol. So you have kind of um, protocols that set how many CO2 emissions are inside of this product or how much work time or how much energy use. And this allows the commons then to quantify, to compare, to optimize their production chains with which partners they want to cooperate, what makes sense to them. And these general goals may be reached by, for example, like today we have the IPCC that tells us that it has different proposals how we could act to each other and then the Commons as a whole um, decide that it makes sense to follow these proposals. And there we have like these general goals that can be implemented into the protocols, into the um, interaction between the Commons. The free cooperation is in the society the basis um, and it's based on need and not on profit. Commons will um, cooperate with each other when it makes sense to them on the use value. We need wheat, um, you have wheat, how can we cooperate? How much can you give to us and all this kind of stuff? The commons need each other and there it for arises an inclusive reproduction because this gains more and more support. 
if a commons has a very um, good way to distribute their goods like in a very inclusive way, it will reach more support because more people um, want to be part of this reproduction group or this reproduction circle and therefore um, it works better. Here I have kind of an example from the future. A hospital in northern France favoured people. Some information leaked by the integrated their direct partner partners which promise with promises of privileged care, but then more found out. Michelle, I produce good medicines for years and then these people dared to make some weird deals with it. I heard they even tried to exchange again, preferential treatment and in return you make sure that I get the house built, built faster. I'm supposed to slave away for someone's self-privileging ass all houses. <laughs> I felt exploited, I betrayed. It reminded me of a history le lesson on capitalism in school. Those rags, really. Let them play market economy in one of those anarcho-capitalist communes that exist in South and Germany. Well, now they pay. Increased monitoring, supervisory councils, strengthened ombudsman offices. No one enjoys it and, uh, and it should die down in the next few years, but first they have to earn back our trust. And that's kind of an example of what could happen if in this um, example as a hospital starts to um, make preferential treatment to certain people because they know them or, and then even try to integrate others. With time they will have huge problems with their partners and if you, if you imagine that they try to hold back this information all the time this, kind, this, this makes cooperation a lot more complex because usually in this structure, the commons will provide all the information that's needed, how they produce, what they produce, how they distribute it, to gain support. And what, what people that try to build a more exclusive way of distribution will do, they, they can't really um, show what they're doing. Like they can't, transparency is kind of um, dangerous to them. So right now we are still very much we discussed this as a duocracy and um, as the opposition between power of hands and power of relations in the duocracy and the power of hands the people that produce decide what to do with the stuff they produced um, so if we produce the bread we will as a commons we'll decide how to distribute it we are dependent on ours and probably it will be inclusive but still we decide and there are two major critiques, there may be others. There's a power hierarchy between productive worker, care workers and caretakers. So the people that are in the infrastructure, in their energy infrastructure, they have a lot of power. If they say, oh, we don't like how you solve this pro conflict or how you're distributing these goods, then I don't, I'm not sure if we will give you all the energy that you need. There's, there's a lot of power behind there. Also, these energy infrastructures, of course, they're linked to all logistics and people that build their energy and infrastructure. So they also a lot, a lot of work time and effort goes in there. So they're again dependent on a lot of people, but it's still there will be there might be a uh, strong hierarchy there. And there's this power hierarchy between commons. Just imagine somebody working in the energy infrastructure, infrastructure one working in the communist supermarket, somebody um, being a care worker doing childcare, and somebody being a child or an elderly person. There's, there are various degrees how these people can contribute to a society. And that's like very dangerous if these um, different positions lead to different uh, positions of power. So um, the power of relation focuses more on the organization of interest groups for wellness, for elderly people, for children or whatever, and they interlink reproduction and civil society. So if we think about this power of relations, we really can't think of this commons association that we usually think of only the reproductive commons coming together, that also like civil society actors may become part of it. So if we think of commons that um, produce homes for elderly people that also associations for elderly will be part of it and um, so we have this interweaving of civil society forces and reproductive forces but the fundamental problem stays they may have like an argument that's like social and the other ones say yeah, we won't do it and then <laughs> the whole process stops
Um, there's also this idea of commons associations that you have like collective planning. For example, if you want to build a tractor, it makes sense that all these commons that work together to build the tractor, they kind of plan together and say, we need this much rubber and this much steel for the next years. Um, or also the Alpine cheese production may form each other up in two different groups that one is like for you know, producing Alpine cheese for Europe, the, the other association for, I don't know, for the whole world or something. And then me is somebody who produces Alpine cheese can decide where, in which association I want to become part of. Um, and the aggregation within, for example, this group may be as, is as long as it's inclusive, democratic and supported. So when this association, when a lot of people realize, okay, this association, they're really good, I want to become part of, they will grow. When then a lot of people realize, okay, we can't, it's too big, it's difficult to reach inclusive decision, I don't feel represented by the structure, they'll just... Um, build an association for their own or produce just um, organize the distribution in another way apart from this association. So there's this possibility of flexible aggregation that different associations, um, they're growing, they're diminishing again. And also important are the meat commons that organize the material, the symbolical and the social. So the symbolical would be like information and all these infrastructure. The material would be the, like what I said about energy infrastructure and water and transportation. And the social would be like to keep plan, um, track of all the planning. Where do the goods go? Is it more or less equally balanced between, I don't know, um, Africa and Europe and all this kind of stuff. So they would keep track of all the information systems and helping with conflicts and all this kind of stuff. They mediate, they empower, they counsel and support um, planning. So empower is also important because as I said, people have like different possibilities within a society. So it's important to have structures to support people, um, to empower them, to raise their voices, to say like, that's um, not fair what's happening there and all this kind of stuff. Okay, just another example. We were in the process of setting up this Rice Commons Association in Vietnam from the very beginning. We were using really exciting sociocratic practices and other commons were already coming over to learn from us. But when the South and Chinese farmer commons came in, the production and distribution policies changed again. They were even more focused on nature-based production and preferred to work with global distribution commons. So after discussions, we therefore dropped out and now supply our products to another association. So that's just what can happen that like when the association has its own culture, its own ideas, and then this um, farmer swap deal with another association that's more to his or her terms. Okay, now it's about conflicts. A lot of times if we think about conflicts and uh, utopia, it's like people think of harmony, but um, we really think that conflict is a practice of freedom and a society of needs will be a society of conflicts. And it's very important to have like conflicts about societal goals because what we do with power hierarchies and money and all this kind of stuff is kind of um, to skip over conflicts. That's, it's just the goods go where the money is and <laughs> who has money and who has power can decide what happens. And so time and the opportunity to really discuss things and to decide where should things go and what is important is really human freedom. Of course there will be normal functioning and low conflict areas, for example like food production it's more or less clear if we decide between building, I don't know, swimming pools for people or building, I don't know what, fancy transportation, then food production will come first because of course this whole food pr production um, system will get a lot more support that it is, oh, we don't have enough food or we don't have enough housing or shelter. The basics come first, kind of. So there, there is, and within these areas, there won't be that many conflicts because it's clear these should come first or also like ecological restructuring. It's clear that we have to do this. <laughs> this should gain a lot of importance. Um, so there are low conflict areas, but there are other areas there where we'll see more discussion because then maybe it's not that important. Maybe we can have, I don't know, less strawberries and more of the other stuff or whatever. Um, and the conflicts are usually that a lot of places make suggestions what could be done and then 
the associations and the commons decide what are the best options. So for the people that come together, media commons or cooperatives or associations to make propositions, for them it's um, suggested to, um, to get very inclusive decisions or conflict solutions so that there are many communes and uh, many communes and civil society actors will um, acknowledge this and we say it's a good solution, we want this, we um, will support this. <clears throat> so one example that comes often, communists adopted an enormously hierarchical housing structure from capitalism, huge mansions next to slums. Today's buildings come, today's building commons construct housing in a much more egalitarian and loving way, but how to distribute the old residences? In Mexico City, villas are given to large groups or occupied on a six-month rotation basis. Tokyo's developed a rotating lottery for the old high-class flats. In Paris, some housing cooperatives divided the flats into clusters with groups of interested people who decide to gather and use this in mediation processes. Singapore introduced credits for luxury items. Already in the transition period, many groups formed up to take up the issue. They compared the proposal, practices, evaluation and results. It stays difficult and also led to frustration. It's good that capitalism is finally over. The legacy is enough. So, is there still a logic of inclusion within conflicts? And we say, we think yes, of the one hand voluntariness, inclusive decision convinces more people and commons. Um, and the free cooperation complicates exclusion, basically. In the short term, there still may exclusive distribution techniques may arise, but middle and long term inclusive structures win because they gain more support, they have a more um, stability in their organizational cooperation. And inclusive conflicts also have another mode. There's, it's a lot about understanding each other and learn from each other and people will change in these conflicts. And just, it's not just about compromise, but really like understanding each other in these conflicts. And therefore the empower to speak, the inclusion of non-present people is very important. Some strategies and some open questions. It may be important to disempower strategic points, like people that have, I don't know, there's usually a scarce mineral discussion, that the, the comments that have these scarce minerals have too much power. So maybe it makes sense to then don't have the work just decide what to do, how to distribute the scarce minerals, but have a a council of different associations and um, civil society actors that come together to decide how to distribute them. Um, there's also a lot of this discussion of a meta institution that has like a law without violence. It's often kind of linked to state, not really a state structure, but like a meta structure that tells you it's a generalist institution that has like, okay, we should do it like this, or these are our base levels ideas that come together. Um, altogether, it says in this society, social innovation is central, whereas in capitalism, it's a lot about building new stuff and all this kind of stuff, or like new profit making possibilities. In this society, it's where it's about our needs and um, trying to understand them and to coordinate them. Social innovation is really central to the society. <laughs> and I think a lot of things we can't decide for now or have no idea because we come from a hierarchical um, structure. In this society, social innovation will be huge and, and very important. And so we, a lot of things may be um, solved by, um, in ways that we can't imagine today. It's still a lot of times people ask us if we still have a, like a communism of homo economica we'll, where we'll, and we usually ask if the people are bad and want to exclude others, how will they do it and can they do it? Or is this logic of inclusion really helping? And um, other people say that's like a very patriarchal and egoistic picture concept of human and humans are much more in relation to others and therefore related to others. Um, and a lot of the problems that we describe may not be that big in the end, but still I think it makes sense to <laughs> really start with um, the, the problems and like what could be problems. And in the end, it's one world of many worlds. Each there, there will be, for example, a council centralism for energy or a communist country that have a like, decentralized way that will 
all these like the central, the decentral and post central part will have their places within the society and it's more the interplay that's like interesting how and how they can interact with each other. Okay, that's our <laughs> the video on coordination. Thanks for listening.